Good morning, good morning. It is great to be with you all uh, again this morning. Um, there is um, a lot of, of scripture that I want to read today. Uh, for the sake of those who aren't familiar with some of the stories, I want to make sure that you have the clear context for how we're going to look at some significant events in the life of Peter. And in this series on building the hearth, um, stewarding the God's presence and stewarding the intimacy of God's presence, we're talking a lot about, about fire and what fire represents and keeping the fire burning and things of that nature. Uh, I want to uh, focus on an aspect about the presence of God that I think sometimes we can forget or trip over. And if this is your issue that I'm talking about today, then you probably struggled throughout this entire series, wondering where you stand with God. Interestingly enough, it has to do with self-condemnation. Because when we talk about God's presence with us, if you feel like, we, and we can talk about keeping the fire burning and things like that, but if you feel that because of your past, because of your mistakes, because of those things, that God has separated himself from you, withdrawn his presence from you, then keeping the fire burning is something that goes in one ear and out the other. You don't think you're even qualified to even talk about the fire conversation. So let's talk about it. One of the things that makes this such a real element for the family of God as they learn the nature of God and who he is as God and as a father is the ideas that we develop about relationships, period. And the ideas that we have about relationships, period, what we can expect from people who say they love us are things that we will naturally carry over and believe about our relationship with God, because that too is a relationship. So for example, if as a child, you believe that when you behave, your parents are affectionate toward you, and when you misbehave, affection is withdrawn from you. There's the disapproval, the disappointment, um, and sometimes as a parent, you've, it's, that's what you've communicated. Because sometimes in a way to manipulate behavior, we can withdraw affection because we know the child doesn't want that. So we think if we withdraw affection, it's gonna be an unpleasurable experience for the kid, so then they'll behave next time. So that they won't lose our affection. Are y'all tracking with me? Yeah. All right. So you can see how that's a problem when you get into a relationship with God. When I misbehave, God has turned. When I misbehave and I want to run to God for a hug, he's like my mom or dad that said, no, not until you learn to behave. I saw this in my own parenting. So here's the, here's the, the ironic thing about this message. As I talk about this, and I talk about being free from condemnation, you might feel condemned. <laughs> That's the irony. Because you're going to feel bad about what I'm going to talk about. But what I want you to learn, though, is how if you do feel bad about your stuff, know that God doesn't feel bad about it with you. That's the big takeaway for today. So if you need to leave now, you can and get the whole message. But if you stay, I'll unpack it and you'll find some more value. God's promise to be with us includes when we're good and when we miss it. His promise to always be with us is not just about time. 
I'll be with you now and even until the end. I'll talk about that verse in a second. Even until the end. But what does that mean? That means in all the moments in between, I am not leaving. My presence will still be with you. And my presence doesn't fluctuate with your feelings and your emotions. My presence doesn't fluctuate when you feel confident or when you feel condemned. Don't, so don't attach your feelings to the eternal promise I've made about my presence always being with you. When you're up, I'm with you. When you're down, I'm with you. When you feel that I'm with you, when you feel that I'm not with you, I'm still with you. Separate the difference between the presence of the Spirit of God in your life with the fickleness of your emotions. Your stuff goes up and down. His doesn't. So when you succeed, God is not more proud of you. And when you fail, he's not more disappointed. It doesn't fluctuate that way. And here's one reason why. Here's one reason why. Because he's not learning about you. He saw it before you did it. In heaven, God never has this face. I can't believe. After all I've done, look, Jesus, did you see that? How, how could he do that? How could she do that? Now we've got to change the entire plan for their life now. <laughs> All of your mistakes are seen and already calculated in the perfection of his plan. So you don't disappoint God. So, but you can disappoint people because people didn't see it coming. You can, you can shock people. Right? When you see these leaders, church leaders, you know, they, they fall, they make mistakes, and people are like, oh, oh, oh. not God. He's like, I saw it coming. I tried to tell them, try to warn them, they didn't listen, here it is. And even if the entire church turns their back on this man or woman of God, I won't. Even if the entire church is all disappointed, I can't believe they were so anointed. They did conferences. They've got 15 campuses. They've got 30,000. And now this, even if the whole church is so disillusioned by that church leader's failure, God, their father, is not. Because that was included in the whole Calvary package. And so is your stuff, even though it ain't public. You want your stuff to go viral? <laughs> okay then. So God, he sees this stuff. And so we think about stewarding the, the presence of God and the intimacy with him. Man, sometimes it's rough when we are playing old tapes in our head. And we're playing tapes in our head that God's not playing in his. Because he knows the power of his blood, the washer sins away. You and I are the ones still learning about what real forgiveness is. You and I are the ones still learning about what it means to have our sins nailed to the cross, as Colossians says. And the whole record of debt that we had against God has been eliminated by the cross. Even when you struggle to believe that, God does not struggle. When he says it is done, it's done. That it's forgiven, it's forgiven. The blood has made you clean, it's made you clean. When he says you have the righteousness of Christ and he sees you through the lens of Christ's perfect righteousness himself, that he sees you as that, he means it. Even if you struggle to believe it, he doesn't. Even when you struggle with the truth of the gospel, well, he doesn't. He invented it. He created it. He's the executive producer of it. So when he sees you as forgiven, doesn't matter if you feel like it or not, he's still going to treat you forgiven. And sometimes God does some things in our lives to communicate this to us, to let us know these kind of things. And we see a wonderful example of this in the life of Peter. Peter, this disciple who was always uh, speaking up, and, and sometimes he put his foot in his mouth, and some, sometimes he messed up, and sometimes he didn't. Sometimes he, he took a risk, and it looked like he succeeded, and he ended up, you know, 
sinking in the water. Like he, this was Peter. He had these ups and these downs. Peter was one of the, the, the three uh, groups, uh, three members of the group that Jesus brought into certain situations apart from the other 12 disciples. When, when, John, when Jesus went in to raise a young girl from the dead, he brought in Peter, James, and John. James and John were two brothers. He brought in Peter, James, and John, left the rest of the 12 outside the house. When Jesus went up to the Mount of Transfiguration, it's called Transfiguration because while Jesus was up there and he began to pray in his human form, he was transfigured. And for a brief moment, Peter, James, and John saw him as like his whole body of lightning. And they saw his glory for a few moments as he talked with Moses and Elijah, two people from the Old Testament that popped up in the New Testament on this Mount of Transfiguration. This was the second time that God's voice came from heaven and said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. The first time that happened, it was at the baptism. The disciples weren't there because Jesus was just starting his ministry. He hadn't called anybody yet. But this time, when that voice comes from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. I'm well pleased with him. Now the disciples, Peter, James, and John, they heard that. And so Peter was one of them who was up there. After that whole situation was over and Jesus like went right back to normal, Peter was like, man, it was good for us to be here. Let's build three tabernacles as, as like a memorial, for one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And Jesus was like, yeah, you, you, you still don't get it. Um, that's, that's not what this is about, Peter. When, when Jesus was walking on the water and the disciples were all in the storm, they were sailing in this boat on this sea. Jesus, before he, they, they, they launched out, Jesus went to go and pray. He says, guys, I'm going to meet you on the other side of the sea. And so go ahead and sail. I'm going to pray and then I'll meet you on the other side of the sea. As the disciples were sailing on this sea, a storm came up and they were really struggling. And if, if a storm wasn't bad enough, they saw Jesus walking on the water and one verse says he would have passed them by he wasn't coming to them on the water he said i'll meet you on the other side he was going to walk across to the other side he was going to meet them on the other side but because the disciples said oh man looks like there's a ghost and we got a storm and a ghost like this is just a bad day and jesus is nowhere around and jesus was like okay see y'all all right guys don't be afraid it's me it's me. And then Peter said, if that's really you, tell me to come out there. Now, Peter, he knew he, he, he had enough sense to know he's not going to just hop out the boat, that he needed the word from the Lord to empower him to do something supernatural. If, if, if that's you, tell me to come. Like, I want to get there, but I, 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 we got a physics problem here. <laughs> if it's you, tell me to come. Jesus says, come. Peter gets out of the boat and he begins to walk on the water. Then he looked at the storm around and that caused him to be concerned. And then he began to sink and he said, Lord, save me. And Jesus reaches down, which means that's how close Peter was, arms, arms linked to Jesus, right? And, and, and picks him up. And they walk, back to, they walk back to the ship on the water. I guarantee you, Peter, Jesus didn't give Peter a piggyback ride back to the water. I mean, back to the ship, right? He walked back to the ship. So Peter walked to Jesus. Did he sing? Yeah, he sang. Let's not forget the fact that he walked. Remember that? I mean, you can't sink unless you're on top. Let's give the man some credit. Well, on top of he sank, he sank, took his eyes off Jesus, he sank. Hold on, before he sank, he was walking. <laughs> and he sank, but he got back, and he was walking right back. This is the same Peter. He saw some of the miracles that the other 12 didn't see. He walked on the water while the other 12, the other 11 stayed in the, in the ship. He saw Jesus raise girls from the dead. He saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain. This Peter. And now, on the night that we have communion, the Lord's Supper, Jesus has a conversation with his disciples and he's telling them about what's going to happen to them. And as you look at Matthew chapter 26, Jesus gives a warning to all of them. He tells them what's about to happen. So let's look at Matthew 26, beginning at verse 31. It says, on the way, Jesus told them, tonight all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd 
and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Okay, side note. You remember, after the resurrection, Jesus was talking to Mary, and he says to Mary, Mary, go tell my disciples and Peter that I'm going to meet them in Galilee like I told them I would. This is when he told them he would. Okay? Just a side note. Connect some dots. Tell him, I'll go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter declared, if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night, tonight, not later, tonight, before the rooster crows, before the morning, you will deny me three times. You'll deny that you even know me. Look at Peter. No. Okay, now at this point, in Jesus' ministry, Peter should know Jesus has been 100% correct about 100% of 100% of what he said. And yet, Jesus tells Peter something about Peter, and Peter says, no, that's not true. Has God ever spoken anything into your heart about you? And you go, no, that's not me. Anybody else? Anybody? If that's you, just raise your hand. Okay, look around the room. Look around the room. Yeah, exactly. It happens. The rest of you, you're just not listening. I'm kidding, right? We're, no condemnation today, remember. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me not once. Not, not twice, three times. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And here's the thing, watch this. And all the other disciples vowed the same. Sometimes that's overlooked. It wasn't just Peter that said it. Peter was quoted. But the other disciples said, yeah, me too. We ride or die. No, nah, player, you just wait and see. No. Nah. So this is Matthew 26. Okay, Matthew 26. Now, this is before the cross. This is before all that. Matthew 28 is when this promise comes. This is after the resurrection. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Now, I quoted this earlier. I just want to read it again. It might be new for some of you. That's the passage there where he says, I'm going to always be with you. I'm going to always be with you. But something happened between the conversation with Jesus was talking to Peter and this moment where Jesus says, I'm going to always be with you. So let's go back to this, this part of the story where Jesus is having this conversation and, and Jesus says, Peter, you're going to deny me. He's like, no, I'm not. I'm going to always be with you. And the disciples say, me too. We're, we're, we're going to always be with you. All right. Let's look at Luke 22. So this is after the Last Supper. This is them going out. They were, they were singing in the, uh, in the Mount of Olives, a hymn. They've already had their last this communion where Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood. They've had this moment where Jesus has washed their feet. They've had this moment, and now they've gone out. And now it says, so they arrested him and led him to the high priest's home. And Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter joined them there. A servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. And finally she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers. But Peter denied it. Woman, he said, I don't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No, man, I'm not. Peter retorted, 
About an hour later, someone else insisted, this must be one of them because he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, when you tell a lie over and over and over, sometimes you just say it with more conviction. Right? You want it to be more believable, right? And you're trying to even believe it yourself. Peter is saying with conviction, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And verse 61 gets me. Watch this. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. You know what's worse than denying Jesus three times? Knowing that Jesus saw you. That's crazy. Like, that's even how close in proximity. Remember, Peter followed at a distance. He's in, pro he's in visual range of Jesus, and Jesus is in visual, which means Peter can actually still see Jesus while he's saying, I don't know him. This isn't even some private gathering, some private room where there's like no accountability. He is in visual range of Jesus all three times. He says, I don't know. That guy right there, I don't know him. The one that called me to walk on water, don't know him. The one whose glory I saw transfigured on the mountain, don't know him. The one I saw raise a dead girl back to life and she went right back to school, don't know him. If you want to talk about the failure of heart, that's it. This was a failure. A massive, massive failure. It's one thing for you and I to get weak in our faith. But Peter, right there with Jesus, three-year internship with Jesus, breakfast with Jesus, lunch with Jesus, dinner with Jesus, three years every day with Jesus, left his family to follow Jesus. Now you're saying in visual range of Jesus, I don't know him. That is a massive failure. So let's keep reading. <laughs> Suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. And Peter left the courtyard, weeping bitterly. Because everything I just said was flashing through Peter's mind. Not only did I do it, he said I was going to do it. He knew I was going to do it. Here's the thing I want you to know. He knows you're going to do it. He knew you were going to do it. And because he knew you are going to do it and knows you're going to do it, he makes provision for when you do it. The, the, the catching net is already placed because he knows you're going to fall off the wire. The grace is already there for your sin because he knows you're going to sin. And he leaves and weeps bitterly. Later on, after Jesus is raised, he dies on the cross, all the disciples are gone, they're hiding out except John. John is staying at the foot of the cross with Jesus' mother, and as Jesus is dying on the cross, he says, John, behold your mom, like, take care of her for me. He says to her, woman, behold your son. He makes this arrangement while his lungs are filling with blood, and his body, the back, his back is so bruised, his organs are visible through his back. He's like, John, take care of. Man, you, you think after three years, man, his boys, we're going to die with you, Jesus. You think all 12 of them would have been there. They weren't. It wasn't just Peter, all 12 of them. They weren't. It was just John. So Jesus dies on the cross. He's raised on that third day. Mary is at the tomb. 
and they'd come and you know they're going to undo the spices and then angels are like ah he ain't here and Mary is crying Jesus appears behind her and this whole conversation Jesus says Mary go tell my disciples and Peter that I'm going to see them in Galilee like I said I would Mary runs to the room where they're hiding out and says, Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. risen. And they're like, Mary, okay. We, we, we get that you love him. We love him too. But let's not start spreading rumors and hallucinating and stuff. The dude, we, he, he's dead. Yeah, he was dead, but he's risen. Like his body is not there. Jane, uh, John and Peter take our running to the tomb. They got to go see it themselves. And they see that his body is not there. They come back to the disciples to kind of let them know. Maybe they'll believe the story being told by men because they had a rough time believing it being told by a woman. That's still true today. But I digress. <laughs> the disciples, 11 of them, are all in this room. And Jesus popped, actually 10 of them, because Judas had already died. He killed himself for feeling bad about betraying Jesus. And Thomas was not in the room. So there's 10 disciples in a room. Jesus pops up in the room and says, peace be unto you. He confirms to them personally, I'm back. I want you to know I'm back. Now this should be a time of rejoicing. But you know, the last time Peter saw Jesus, and the last time Jesus saw Peter, you remember what that encounter was like? You know sometimes when you know you did somebody wrong, you feel a little anxious about seeing them again? So here Jesus says, guys, I'm back. And Peter's like, oh, great. Oh, great. I don't even know if I can look him in the eye. Jesus leaves that encounter. Thomas isn't there. Then Thomas pops up. And the disciples are telling Thomas, Thomas, Jesus is back from the dead. He's real. And Thomas is like, nah, I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't believe it. And Jesus pops up again. Because Thomas said, I got, if I, I got to put my hands in his side and, and my hands in, his, in, the, in the nails in his wrist to, in order for me to believe it. Jesus pops up again. Doesn't use a window. Doesn't use a door. He just pops up again and says, peace be unto you. Let me, let me tell you something. Jesus or not, let some dude pop up in my room when I don't expect him. Ain't going to be no peace. Don't, don't, don't come up saying peace be unto me. No, it's about anxiety be unto me. Right? Fear being unto me. That's, that's. Pop up talking about, be calm. No, nah, bro. No, nah, no. Nah, we, we left calm a long time ago. You didn't, you didn't knock. You didn't email. Didn't text. Didn't, you know. So he says, peace be unto you. And then he comes to Thomas and says, Thomas, here I am. Here's the hole. You want your hand? And Thomas is like, oh, my bad. I don't even need to touch it, bro. Uh, <laughs> clearly, you're the guy, right? And Jesus says, you believe because you've seen. But blessed are those who will believe without seeing. But here's what I want you to know. Peter is still in his condemnation. He is still in his guilt. But what's interesting is that in this conversation, in John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. I'm sending you. All of you, including Peter, I'm sending you. You're on a mission. I'm not counting any of you out. I'm sending you. Thomas, even though you doubted, I'm sending you. Peter, even though you denied me, I'm sending you. The rest of y'all scared folks, I'm sending you too. And he leaves. After the resurrection, again, later on, Peter and the disciples, they're, they're, they're not preaching, they're fishing. And Jesus pops up on the beach. They don't recognize Jesus. And, and similar to when they first met Jesus, they're fishing and they haven't caught anything. And on the beach, Jesus says, friends, have you caught anything? And they say, no, we haven't caught anything. 
And Jesus says, again, they don't recognize him. Jesus says, cast your nets on the other side of the ship. When they cast their nets on the other side of the ship, they got so many fish that their nets began to break. And Peter was like, I only know one person who can do that. Peter puts on his robe and jumps into the water. Now, normally if you're swimming, what do you do? You take off clothes. Maybe he thought he was going to walk again. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so he swam. He swam to Jesus. And on this beach, Jesus was cooking some fish. I don't, I don't think Jesus believes in sushi. He was frying the fish. The Bible says he was frying. He was, he was cooking it. And this is what it says, John 21, verse 15 to 17. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? <clears throat> yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Why do you think he asked him that three times? Because he denied him three times. And now three times, Peter is declaring his love for Jesus. And as Jesus says, feed my sheep. All the other disciples are present, but Jesus is talking to Peter. Feed my sheep. They're my sheep. They're my lambs. And I'm still giving you the responsibility to feed them. I saw what you did. Watch this part. But I also know what you're going to do. I saw what you did. You know, I said, we made eye contact when you did it. I saw that. But Peter, I want you to know you're still in the game. Peter, I want you to know I still trust you with my sheep and my mission. That's what Jesus does with condemnation. He comes with love. He comes with forgiveness. And he comes with restoration. And he restores Peter so that Peter would know. Jesus already had the same perspective of Peter, the same opinion. His opinion didn't change. But Peter needed to know this is how Jesus saw him. Because if not, the devil could have a field day playing in Peter's mind about what, what and, and lying to Peter about what God thinks of Peter, what Jesus thinks of Peter. Now Jesus himself steps into the scene and says, I want you to know, Peter, what I really think about you. I haven't changed. I still love you. I'm still including you. I'm still trusting with responsibility. You're still on the in the game. You're still on my team. Feed my sheep. And so then what happens later in the book of Acts, it is Peter, when the Holy Spirit comes and they're speaking in tongues and, and people are, are, are trying to figure out why these people are speaking in tongues, that it sounds so strange. And, and Peter steps forward and says, guys, this is what the prophet prophesied. Peter preaches and 3,000 people get saved after hearing Peter's message. You're still in the game. I still trust you. You're still called. You're still gifted. You're still anointed. You're still filled. I still include you. I still love you. So you can pick yourself up out of the self-condemnation because it's not God condemnation. You did it to yourself because how you felt about your performance but I want you to know what I think about your performance. It's separate from what I think about you. And I love you always. I'm with you always. 
I don't celebrate you more when you succeed and celebrate you less when you fail. My love for you can't grow. It's already all of it. You can't earn more love. You can't lose less love. You can't earn more approval. You can't do something to cause let God to, to think of you less. You, you can't do it. This is what his eternal love and eternal acceptance is about. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are free from a performance-based religion and a performance-based relationship. You are free from that. And you can rest in the security of Christ knowing that when God puts you in Christ, he thinks about you the same way he thinks about his own son. And in fact, he has made you a son and a daughter. So when we think about stewarding the presence of God and this intimacy with God and this fire and this flame, one thing you need to know about the presence of God is even when your fire for him dwindles, his fire for you never does. It's always there. I'm with you always. Up and down. Up and down. In your mind and in your world, you have the good days and the bad days. But in, from God's perspective, you're just his always. Were those bars? In your mind and in your world, you have good days and bad days. But in God's perspective, you're just his always. Yeah, I think those were bars. As always, that's what he knows about you, that you're his. And so the ways that you have thought about relationships because of how you grew up, because of your imperfect parents, don't transfer that over to the perfect relationship that God has with you, the perfection of God's fatherhood with you. I want our ushers to come and prepare us for, for communion. And as we do this, I want you to and this is a good message as we lean into this. The reality that has been given to us is that not only are our sins forgiven, but he's with us always. You remember Emmanuel, God with us? That's, that's not a Christmas message. That's not a seasonal truth. That's an eternal truth. God with us. That's one of the things that's now different in the new covenant because of the blood of Jesus that we're going to acknowledge and celebrate. Because of the blood of Jesus, the new covenant is more solidified like this, this truth, than it was in the Old Testament. And too many times you're reading stories in the Old Testament thinking that his relationship with people in the Old Testament is the same as his relationship with you, and it's not. Jesus has come, the cross has come, the blood has been shed. And so in the Old Testament, God's spirit could be upon somebody and if they keep on messing up, he will take his spirit away. In the new covenant, it's not like that. You are in Christ. Nothing can change that. Your performance didn't get you in and your performance can't get you out. You are in Christ. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he instituted something that he wanted to use as kind of like a memorial service for us. So that we could remember the cross but in remembering the cross, the point of it is remembering what's true now on the cross. What has been accomplished for us because of the cross. Yes, our sins have been forgiven. And because our sins have been forgiven, we've been united with God in Christ. And because we've been united with God in Christ, apart from our performance for God, we have a relationship that's not based on it. But instead, it's based on our faith in Christ. And that net that he put underneath us is a net called grace. God will never leave you because of grace. He will never forsake you because of grace. He will never turn his back on you because of grace.
So on that night, when Jesus knew Judas would betray him, Thomas would doubt him, Peter would deny him, and when he knew that all of us would do the same, he also knew what the cross was going to do to all of that. His body was nailed to the cross, and with it so were our sins. And so he took the bread and he blessed it, and he gave thanks and he told his disciples, took the cup he said this is the new covenant in my blood it's because of my blood that your sins will be forgiven because of my blood that I can be with you and in you always it's because of my blood that you'll be an heir of God and a joint heir with me because of my blood you'll be a new creature because of my blood there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Drink ye all of it. After that, they went out singing a hymn, and that's where they arrested Jesus. And Peter denied him. And the story goes on. Let this be sealed to you. Does that mean my time is up? Are y'all doing that right now? <laughs> Let this be a reminder to you. This is why he said to keep doing it. Because I want you to always remember. Because I know things will be said and things will be done where you'll forget. I want you to always remember these eternal truths and realities. Father, thank you so much for the cross. Thank you so much that you will be with us always, even until the end of the age, and nothing can change that. Thank you for our forgiveness, that there is no condemnation, and we can be free to stomp on the lies of the enemy when he tries to tell us differently. Father, I pray for freedom today, that the truth of your gospel would cause demons to flee, and spirits to be revived, souls to be healed and relieved. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.